Well, I am honored to be here, as the other presenters have, have, have mentioned as well. Um, I'm a native Angelino. Uh, I went to Sixth Avenue Street School, so I'm actually a product of the Los Angeles public school system. Proud to be that. Um, I started out uh, living very close to Crenshaw and Jefferson, so if you know this city, you know that area, that's where I lived initially. Uh, in 1960, uh, my parents had a really important decision to make, which was would we stay there and they would invest in a private school for me, or would they move out to the San Fernando Valley, uh, where the schools were more affluent and where they assumed I would get a much better education in the public schools. And they made the decision to move to Canoga Park, and so if you know Canoga Park, that's where I went and finished elementary school and went to junior high school. And then I went to Chatsworth High School when it was brand new. I was one of three African American students and engaged in serious rebellion with my parents because I was an auto shop major and a math minor. And uh, for the first 10 years of my career, uh, I made the argument that it might not have been a bad idea to maintain a career as an auto mechanic just based on the fact that they would make it much more money than I was at the time as an assistant professor. Uh, as an endowed professor, I'm doing okay, so uh, you know, I don't know how the mechanics are, but Washington University is taking very good care of me. So uh, as a Californian and a native Los Angelino, I am honored to be back and especially to talk about this particular topic today of experimental studies of voice discrimination against the Latinas and uh, it is just tremendous. I, I too want to give a shout out to the organizers. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was part of the email rush that said, hey, did, you know, everybody knew what was going on in Arizona. I, I didn't even feel like I had an outlet. I was frustrated and then this opportunity came, you know, thanks to the organizers and, and thanks to the awareness uh, within our own community about who's doing research on various topics. And in my particular case, uh, I would like to begin by dedicating this uh, presentation to my former student, uh, Professor Leticia Galindo, who's no longer with us. Uh, she passed away uh, from cancer probably now about 12 years ago. But uh, Leticia was really an extraordinary student, uh, taught at the University of Texas at Austin. And she and I became very, very dear friends, and she was the first a uh, student of Mexican ancestry that I supervised for the PhD dissertation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about her at the end of the presentation and her life in West Texas. But I want to begin with some work that I did about 15 years ago to lay down the theoretical foundation of, of what I want to present today. And it's based on my work on econolinguistics. In 1996, we did a Feshref in honor of uh, my mentor and the mentor of many other uh, prominent sociolinguist William LeBeau, and in that paper, I present in that script, I presented a, a paper on a theory of econolinguistics, and I came up with the kind of obvious um, hypothesis that linguistic behavior uh, can be thought of as an economic commodity, based on the work of Bourdieu and others and the concept of linguistic capital. If you think about different speech communities throughout the world, your own linguistic proficiency will have greater or lesser utility depending upon the particular community and what language system is valued there. So what you see on the left is a formula for intelligibility when two speakers uh, may not share the same language. And we're looking at, on the top line, the efficiency with which someone who is speaking language Z when X is speaking and Y is listening. If everything is completely understood, it gets a value of one. The next line down is the same formula, but it, it, it's a situation where the efficiency with which language Z is understood when X is speaking and Y is listening, absolutely nothing is understood, right? And of course, there will be different values in between. So a little bit further down, I have one efficiency question that's valued at 847, that's a pretty high value, meaning that a tremendous amount of information is being exchanged when A is speaking his native language A to a, a listener B who may not have uh, 
native competence in language aid. This is from Gillian Sankoff's work on the social life of language, and she developed this model in New Guinea to look at different degrees to which people from different language backgrounds were, were effectively communicating. And then I added to that the formula on the right, which is uh, a very simple consumption uh, expenditure formula that's produced by most economists. And it, and it looks at disposable income. And in its most simple terms, if you can imagine that X is talking to Y or vice versa, right, that they're flipping roles in a conversation, one of those people is likely to have greater discretionary income than the other, right? It's a, it's a very crude measurement, but it's a heuristic device to look at uh, differences in economic income, the efficiency with which information is transferred, and I use this heuristic device for a lot of the policy research that I do. So that policy research in different countries looks at the social stratification of linguistic diversity. And within that, we see that there are native speakers of dominant languages in different speech communities throughout the world. And within those dominant languages, there tend to be dominant dialects. So if you spend any time in France, you know that Parisian French is the prestige variety. In London, the received pronunciation of the uh, well-educated classes is the dominant norm there. But there are also those who are native speakers of those dominant languages, but they are not the native speakers of the dominant dialects, right? And there are also individuals who are not native speakers of those dominant languages. Now in the United States, that translates into a situation where English tends to be the dominant language. And so you have native speakers of standard English, and I'm making a distinction between the national standard, which is produced by most broadcasters, and then also regional pronunciations, which I think are beautifully displayed by many of our congressional representatives. Um, they come from different parts of the country.